Welcome to chapter 17, which the book calls Projecting Cash Flow and Earnings, but what I have pulled out of it is the discussion and coverage of financial statements and ratio analysis. Dear students, we've done the heavy lifting. Chapters 5 and 6, Introduction to Stocks and the Common Stock Valuation Techniques, the few that we've learned, are the heart of our stock uh, um, investigations. But these financial statements and ratios are very important. Why? Well, if only because Mr. Benjamin Graham in The Intelligent Investor uses them extensively. And who am I to argue with him? So eventually you're going to read The Intelligent Investor. Don't read it. Don't be at the, don't read it the first book. Read one up on Wall Street. Read a, a random walk down Wall Street first. And you will see how Mr. Graham artfully uh, uses these ratios, the ratio analysis, to identify good and not so good investments. So um, you may, if you're an accounting student, be wondering about the financial statements. Relax, we're not going to create them. We investors use them. We <laughs> we rely on the accountants to uh, to do those financial statements for us, okay? So don't worry, no no trial balances, no journal entries, all right? I'm good. Slide number two. The three financial statements that every publicly traded company must supply to the world are the balance sheet, income statement, and the cash flow statement. And if you've taken Business 121, we kind of cheat. We call the balance sheet the net worth statement. And we call the income statement the cash flow state. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You, there's another statement called the cash flow statement. What's going on here? Well, the accountants cringe when we in financial planning use uh, the term cash flow statement for an income statement, you know, income and expenses. Uh, but, hey, it works for us. In the investment world, in the world of generally accepted accounting principles, uh, there are two different uh, items, which we'll take a look at in detail in just a moment. But very quickly, the balance sheet shows us a snapshot of the firm's assets, liabilities, and equity, which uh, in Business 121, Financial Planning and Money Management, we call net worth. But they're, they're the same things. In other words... How much does the firm own? How much do they owe? <laughs> and what's left over? The income statement is more the movie of their financial situation. The operating results. Uh, looking at money coming in, revenue, and expenses that must be paid, and what's left over, sometimes called net income or the bottom line. And then the cash flow statement is not what we think of when we think of cash flow. The cash flow statement sh is showing us what's going on with the checkbook. It's showing us uh, what monies have come in and what monies have gone out. And you say, well, how, why is that different from income? Relax. We'll see. You accounting majors, you accounting students know that there are certain expense items which really aren't expenses, we don't write out a check to uh, depreciation, for example, but it allows us to to reduce our income uh, for the IRS, right? So we don't have to pay as much taxes. But that money still stayed inside the firm. So that's what the statement of cash flows now just regard now just called a cash flow statement is. So let's take a look at each one in detail. The balance sheet shows us the assets what the company owns, and the liabilities, the debts, what the company owes. And then what is left over is called equity. And they often use the formula assets equals liability plus equity. But we think of it as assets minus liability equals equity, the same formula. Well, why? Well, because before the advent of computers, when uh, accountants would make these balance sheets, they would put assets on one side, the left side, and then liabilities and equities on the right side, and the two must balance. You see the idea? 
But now you never see it that way because the computers you see assets, liabilities, and then equity. And the accountants um, differentiate between current lia current uh, um, assets and current liabilities and long-term assets and long-term liabilities. Remember we said that long-term in our world is five, seven, or more years. Well, in their world, long-term is anything greater than one year. Uh, that's, the, that's the accountant's world. Current means within one year, something you're going to use within a year. So let's take a look at a balance sheet example. On the website are um, three links to Ford's balance sheet, uh, income statement, and cash flows. Let's take a look at the, the balance sheet. And when you go online, I you have to be careful because sometimes you know you look at Yahoo's, you look at more... Um, um, market watch and then you go look at Ford's balance sheet on their <laughs> on their um, annual report and they they do things differently depending on um, on uh, where you are and this is where the accountants really have a, a one leg up on us just mere mortals because they better understand all the differences but we got the gist of what's going on here and the cool thing is that you can watch it through time. You can see the, the previous years. Also, you can ask to see quarter by quarter because they have to report it every quarter. But we see as of December 31st, 2018, that Ford had oh, almost 17 billion, because you have to add an extra three zeros, uh, dollars in cash or cash equivalents. They also had 17 billion dollars in short-term investments. Plus, $65 billion, almost $66 billion was owed to them. And then they had inventory of $11 billion and other current assets, whatever they are. So, oh my goodness, um, um, Ford had $114.5 billion in current assets. And then they had another <laughs> over $100 billion in long-term investments, property, plant, and equipment. So their total assets are $256 billion and a half, right? Well, wait a minute. They also owe money. Notice the current liabilities, accounts payable, short-term debt that's coming due, and other current liabilities of $95.5 billion. And when we get to our next presentation, we'll see that one of the ratios we look at is the relationship of the current assets to the current liabilities. Very important relationship. And then they owe a ton of money. <laughs> Look at that. Um, over $100 billion in long-term debt and some almost $23.5 billion in other liabilities. So they're looking at $220 billion in liabilities. They have $256 billion in assets. So what's left over? About $36 billion. And we call that stockholders' equity. Does that make sense? Now... Obviously, if you've done account, if you've taken accounting or put, done some kind of accounting, this is, oh, I understand this. And it's really not that hard to understand once you've looked at a few and um, figured out what's going on. So let's go back to the presentation and take a look at our next uh, income, uh, next financial statement, and that's the income statement. Income is the difference between the revenues, the to sometimes called the top line uh, number, and then subtracting out all the expenses and, and, and all the other stuff. And then what's left over, the bottom line is the net income. But as we saw, we'll discuss in, in the next slide, sometimes income and expenses are not always received or paid in cash. But before we do that, let's take a look at the income statement, which is right here. And so there's that top line number. If you listened to one of the earnings reports and they kept talking about the top line number. This is what you're talking about. How much revenue came in the door for the year 2018? And you can see it through time. And the cost of that revenue, how much, oops, how much did it cost them to build those cars? So they took in $160 billion, but it cost them $137.5 billion to build the darn things. So their gross profit is almost $23 billion. 
But then there's that S, G, and A, or sometimes S, A, and O, you, and they expect you to know that, right? There, in other words, what are the overhead costs? What are the uh, sales costs, the general costs, the administrative costs? That's what that S, A, and O, and S, G, and A, that's what they throw out those terms. So their operating income is over $3 billion. Their gross profit was almost $23 billion, but then they had all this overhead they had to deal with. And so now they have um, uh, three billion, but then they had some other income, which bumped up their their um, income to almost well, was five and a half billion. They had to pay interest, and then there's the income before taxes. Then they had to pay taxes. I'm not sure what minority interest is. I have to go look that up. But then here it tells us that hey, they earned three point six eight two billion dollars. Which is a significant drop from the year before. You see, they're, they're, um, things are slow, and folks, people are are a little bit behind on their their car payments. Actually, some of them are far behind on their car payments, and that's why you hear people saying recession's coming. Well, we know it's going to happen eventually. It's been over ten, almost not quite over ten years, but it's been it's been a long time, and so. Um, uh, we're 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 long overdue, so we'll see we'll see what happens. But Ford is sort of, and the car companies are very sensitive to the economic cycle. So there's the top line number, and then there's the bottom line number. Very cool. Okay, so let's now put that by guy down, and that's why we said we said some income and expenses are not always received for or paid for in cash, and that's why we have our next uh, financial statement the cash flow statement, or the older term is the statement of cash flows. And what's the idea behind this? The idea behind this is to show that, look, you know, maybe the company reported this much income, but they really did bring in a whole lot more cash. Why? Because of depreciation. And that's the biggie, especially for companies like Ford and other automo automobile makers who have tremendous upfront costs. But then there are other um, ways that the, the, the money uh, moves around. Operating cash flow, investment cash flow, financing cash flow, and uh, uh, issuing or repurchasing new shares, purchasing and sale of assets and investments and, and, uh, and other, other um, items, which um, are just sort of grouped into uh, different categories that may or may not make sense to the mere mortals that we are. But in other words, we're trying to watch what's going on with, with Ford's cash. So let's go down to the cash flow statement now. And notice that the cash flow statement end, or starts, begins, I'm sorry, begins where the income statement ended. Do you remember the $3.682 billion that Ford, um, Ford uh, 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 made last year in 2018? Well, that's where we start. And then what do we, the first thing we do, look, there's the biggie. We add back in depreciation. Ford was able to reduce their income by $8.3 billion. And why would you want to do that? You pay fewer taxes, right? It's the, it's the same thing, you know, corporations are like people in that respect. We want to uh, maximize our deductions so we pay Uncle Sam less, fewer dollars. And that's exactly what Ford did. But then there were other adjustments and changes in liabilities and inventories and the like. So it turns out that they were able to bring in an extra $15 billion in cash from, uh, from just their activities that they did. Ah, but what about their investments? They made huge capital expenditures and other, uh, uh, investments and cash flows from investing activities. So their checkbook went down $16.25 billion, right? Along with going up 15 over here, over in operating activities and investment activities, that was a negative $16 billion. And then financing activities was a, a negative $122 million, you know, small change. So it turns out that Ford's checkbook, after all these numbers are done, actually went down by $370 million. So they had 370 fewer, few, 370 million fewer dollars. Whereas the last year, 2017, 
which you know most people consider the peak of our uh, well you know we're still growing we're not we haven't gotten recession yet but it's sure looking get ready folks get ready for volatility don't panic <laughs> yeah and so uh and then the year before that though if we go back another year it uh 2000 what was that 2016 their checkbook went down but remember ford and the other companies are doing it too they're spending a ton of money on driverless cars and new technologies because they know they're not stupid they know that the future is probably electric because electric cars are are very cool once they figure out the batteries and um and the few driverless too I mean that's uh, that's uh, that's 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 look well, that's what they're staring at. That's what they're thinking at. Some of them, you know, like Toyota and Honda, are still thinking of maybe hydrogen, but I think I don't think they're right. Uh, you know, fuel cells are very expensive, <laughs> but they are cool. They are very very cool. Um, but hydrogen is such a sneaky little atom. I mean, it just gets out of everything. But Honda and Toyota say they figured that one out. Okay. So, but anyway, that's what's going on with, with Ford's cash. Cool? Okay, good. So now you've gone through the three uh, uh, different major financial statements. And this is something, of course, when we take a look, this further enhances our understanding and our investment research into our potential uh, the companies we want to invest in. Cool. Very well done. Now, where do we get the financial statements? Well, every quarter, every year, publicly traded companies now have a obligation to submit this information to the Securities and Exchange Commission through a system called EDGAR. And I forget what it stands for. I'm not sure what it stands for, but you can look it up. They have to do a 10K, that's the annual report, and then they have to do a 10Q, the quarterly report. And then in the class, this is, I, I, I know, it's a, it's a sickness. I can't help it, folks. At the, at the students, in the face of a student, says, now what's the annual report? They say 10K. And then what's the quarterly report? They say 10Q. And I said, what was that? They say 10Q. I said, louder, 10Q. And I said, you're welcome. <laughs> oh, I, I just, I, it's a, I apologize. But <laughs> and then, uh, back in the 90s, you know, oh my goodness, 20 years ago, the Securities Exchange Commission was very uh, worried about what was going on in the investment world because what would happen is the companies would have these meetings where analysts from Wall Street firms and mutual fund companies and pension fund companies would attend and the companies would make certain pieces of information available to them before the general public uh, learned of it. And they said, look, no, no, no more. And, and part of that was just because of the technology. You know, it just, it was just, you know, it took a while for you to get your reports and send them out. And then they had to be printed and distributed. But not anymore because of technology now, uh, because of the uh, brand new technology called the Internet. We can pump these things out to the world at a certain time. And everybody around the world can take a look at the the the, the uh, information at the same time. So we called they called it Regulation FD, fair disclosure. And so the company sets a date and a time. This is what the earnings call. Remember, so I ask you to do this in Chapter Five. So boom, that information is is in, injected into the uh, into the uh, by, you know, cyber sphere, and everybody gets to see it at the same time. Ah, oh, and there's just so many other places, so many, so many. And I, I, I have heard many investors opine that nowadays there's simply too much information, right? It used, many people, the value line and the company's um, annual report was all they used for decades. You know, now it's just ah, a sip from the fire hose. And this one gentleman by the name of Nick Murray, who's actually a very good writer, I'm sure by now he's retired, but he has a great saying, wisdom sold separately, <laughs> right? You get all this information, but um, does it help you at all? Not if you don't have any wisdom, and that's sold separately. You, know, you, don't, you don't get that for free. Slide number seven, financial ratios. Well, this is a bit of review. We discussed this in, in, in a little bit in uh, Chapter 5 when we said that a financial ratio is the relationship between 
two financial quantities expressed as a quotient of one divided by the other. And then we took a look in chapter 6 at some ratio models, the price ratio models, price to get to earnings, price to cash flow, price to sales. So we're going to do a little bit of review. So we'll run through this, you know, fairly um, quickly. And of course, if we go too fast, you know, you just pause it, stop it, go back. And of course, the analysis, the ratio analysis is the study of the relationships. And we've done a little bit of that, of that. We're going to continue to do more throughout this chapter. And if you recall, there is no one ratio that can accurately sum up the overall general state of a company. We, much, we, we must look at each ratio in the context of all the other information that we've gathered. Plus, you must consider any ratio in the context of the industry. Right? You can't just look at the company. We've, 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 you know, we've said this if, uh, before, and we'll say it again. You got to, you have to look at their competitors. So we'll take a look at an example, some examples soon. All right. So now, here are the common stock ratios. We've looked at all of these. Actually, not the peg ratio. We haven't looked at the peg ratio yet. So, so these. Um, ratios, the market ratios, the common stock ratios, we've already uh, reviewed many of them. And again, they're very simple to calculate, and most of them are already there for you. You don't have to calculate them. But PE, the peg ratio, we'll take a look at that. Dividends per share, dividend yield, dividend payout ratio, book value per share, the price to book, the price to cash flow, the price to sales. These are all review. So let's take a look at the P.E. again. Why? Because it is the most popular stock market statistic. And as we've said, historically, P.E. ratios were in the 5 to 12 ratio, 14 to 20 for growing companies. But now, now greater than 20 is commonplace. And as we said, and I don't know if it means anything. I mean, Peter Lynch discussed it, and that's why I put it here. The P.E. ratio also tells you how long it will take in years, assuming no changes in earning, but of course everything's changing all the time, for the company to earn back its price. So if you had a P.E. ratio of three, that means in three years it's going to earn back that price. Now, does that mean it's going to pay it out in dividends? Maybe, maybe not, but, but that's something to just think of, right? A P.E. 20 will take 20 years, a P.E. 50, 50 years, yeah. So let's take a look at some examples here on slide number 10. Okay, you with me? These are companies that are in varying industries, Exxon Energy, Facebook, you know, Internet Space, as it's called. Amgen is a biotech company, very powerful, large company. U.S. Bank, right, one of the big, too big to fail banks. <laughs> General Mills, Cheerios, uh, all types of foodstuffs, and then Pfizer, a drug company. Well, you're looking at these PEs, and, you know, I don't know. They're sort of similar. Obviously, Facebook and Pfizer, a little higher PEs. You know, Amgen and Exxon, that's about average, 15, 16. But General Mills and U.S. Bank, a little on the low side these days, 12, 13, 14. Well, remember, we must, must, must look at the competitors. So if we... Take a look now at their competitors. We can see a better picture of what's going on. You look at the energy companies, and they're all within a fairly narrow range. Investors are a little more excited about the prospects for Exxon and Chevron and BP. Eh, not too excited about Shell and Conoco, but none of them are uh, out of you know that big a range, out of the ordinary. But you come over here to the Internet and other technology companies, and you see Facebook is pretty, uh, you know, pretty uh, uh, optimistic, but Google's even more. Twitter, eh, but look at Amazon and Netflix. Oh, my goodness. And does that mean we shouldn't buy them? Does that mean we should buy them? No, it just is a, a you can think of it like a little red flag. Whoa, 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 why does Netflix command or Amazon command these huge PEs? Well, it's all about the future and future expectations. And investors are willing 
to pay a huge premium for Amazon and Netflix because they believe they're going to take over the world. <laughs> now, what happens if at Netflix and Amazon don't deliver? Right. The parachutes had better be very large because there's a long way to fall. Right. <laughs> and then we go over to the biotech companies, um, and you see that these are, you know, pretty respectable. But then what's going on with Illumina? Hmm, look at that. That's pretty darn amazing. Well, that's a red, little red flag. We've got to jump up and down and, um, and take a look at the Illumina and try to figure out why they are commanding such. Maybe it's warranted. Do you remember the discussion of growth versus value back in uh, Chapter 5? Where Google had a huge P.E. and GM had a very low P.E. And, uh, ooh, yeah, right. And it turned out that Google was the better buy. So maybe Illumina is a, Illumina is a great company. But, no, it's going to be very speculative. But that's where the, uh, the huge home runs uh, could come from, the, uh, the Hail Mary pass. And I don't know about you, but they, they scare me because I've been burned before. But, but you decide. Now this is this is on this computer. I should have checked it, but the, on the on your computer, I'll probably put it up here. But that's not that's not supposed to be down there. I can stop and fix it, but you know that it belongs up there, right? Um, but on my other computer, it was fine. Uh, darn it! Look at the banks. What's happening with the banks? Thankfully, the banks are getting boring again. Banks are supposed to be boring, folks. They're not supposed to be exciting. They're not supposed to, to be having high, huge PEs because they're supposed to be banks. They're supposed to be boring. And it turns out that the banks are boring again. And hopefully that will keep us from the next financial crisis. Don't bet on it. What about the food companies? Well, General Mills and Kellogg's, yeah, respectable. But what's going on with Hormel? Hormel what do they make? Spam, right? And uh, obviously, investors are, are pretty excited about Hormel's prospects vis-a-vis -vis with regard to the other food companies. What's going on with Kraft Heinz, huh? Why does it say N.A.? Well, that's because they're losing money. When you see N.A., they don't normally report the, uh, the um, P.E. as negative because, of course, if, if the earnings are negative, then, then not, the uh, result would be negative. So, And Kraft... And Heinz, Kraft Heinz, the same, same company, have been in the news uh, lately because things are looking a little sketchy for them. Mm -hmm. And, of course, Mr. Warren Buffett bought into them, so everyone's saying he made a bad choice. But we'll see. We'll see. But what about Hormel? I just love, I mean, if I were the king of Hormel, which I'm not, I'm CEO, I would do a an email marketing campaign called spam mail, right? Because spam is email that you don't want, right? And it comes from the Monty Python skit where the woman didn't want the spam and they kept giving her more and more spam. But I would say, this is spam! <laughs> and you're going to want it. Here's a free coupon or whatever. Oh, forget it. Now look at the, uh, the, ba the uh, not the banks, the, the, uh, the drug companies. Here are the drug companies. Pfizer, you know, pretty respectable. Mr. Miles, Squibb, eh. But Merck and Eli Lilly, here are two companies that investors are very excited about. And again, it doesn't mean we shouldn't buy it. It doesn't mean we should buy it. It means we need to do more research. Think of it like a little red flag waving. Ooh, look at me, look at me. And maybe there's something really exciting that we're interested. Make sense? I hope so. And so this is just one ratio. And we need to do the same for the other. So let's take a look at some of the other ratios. Oh, I'm sorry. Before we do that, slide number 11. How can we account for the wide P.E. disparity between different industries and different companies with industries? Again, as we've said in the past, it is the expectation of future earnings and dividend growth by investors. So here's a cute um, uh, quote from the random walk down Wall Street by the founder of the Dreyfus Funds, Jack Dreyfus. Now, I think Dreyfus Funds are now owned by the Bank of New York, right? Uh, take a nice little company that has been making shoelaces for 40 years and sells at a respectable six times earnings ratio. I mean, now a company's selling at six times earnings ratio. We think it's, it's dead. It's, it's moribund. But here's a company that makes shoelaces. <laughs> Not very exciting. 
But if you change the name from shoelaces to electronics and silicon firth burners, of course he wrote this in the 1960s, right, when, when all of a sudden electronics and silicon were exciting. In today's market, the words electronics and silicon are worth 15 times earnings. However, the real play comes from the word firth burners, which no one understands. A word that no one understands entitles you to double your entire score. There we for we have six times earnings for the shoelace business, 15 times earnings for the electronics and silicon for a total of 21 earnings. Multiply this by two for Firth Burners. And we now have a score of 42 times earnings for the new company. Yeah, if you replace Firth Burners with cryptocurrency or 3D pin it, printing and replace silicon, Electronics with social network and, and China and now marijuana <laughs> or nanotechnology, biotechnology. I mean, there's a. I think I don't think I told you. I told I tell the face to face students when we go through the um, the one worksheet. Nanotech is a company that's based here in uh, San Diego. I'm not even sure they're around anymore. But but about 10, 12 years ago, when nanotechnology started making its way into the um, into the news and the and the and the and the mainstream media, um, their stock started to rise, and nothing had changed. You know, the stock started to rise and rise and rise. A small company, and they didn't know what was going on, and people just figured it's because somebody heard about nanotechnology and said, oh, "I gotta buy something." Uh, here's a company that's called Nanotech. It must be uh, something to buy, mm, folks. Yes, it's true, people. Don't always go through all the uh, due diligence, all the research that you prudent, long-term oriented investors will do. And that gives you one up on them. <laughs> Slide number 12. So here's that ratio we talked about that we haven't take, taken a look at yet. That's the peg ratio. This compares the price to earnings ratio to the rate of growth. As we said... In the past, a company's PE should basically match their growth rate. That was the uh, that was the norm. So the peg ratio basically puts that into a number. You take the PE ratio and then divide it by their growth rate, three year, five year, whatever. And if it comes out to be one, that means that their PE ratio matches their growth rate. So that was desirable. It meant that the P.E. was equal to the growth rate. Anything above one was considered high, but now greater than one is common. Why? Because it is. <laughs> Investors, traders are willing to spend more uh, for a dollar's worth of earnings. That's basically what's happening now. Now, are they all right about the future? We'll see. Others say, oh, no, we're in an everything bubble. Of stocks, bonds, real estate, everything is too expensive. Why? Because of uh, very, very cheap credit and available credit. And that's a whole other discussion, dear students, a whole other discussion. I tend to agree with them in part, but not in whole. I believe much of the reason is just because we're going through a, a, a time, a period in time when the emerging markets are basically looking at the West and saying, you know, you know, capitalism might be the worst possible system ever devised for the economy, except for all the others, <laughs> and, and they are they are going through their um, transition into the uh, modern economies that we went through, you know, over a hundred years ago, and I think it's good, you know, because people like to eat. And they don't want their children dying of dysentery, and that's a, that's another discussion. So let's continue. So I'm I'm optimistic. I keep saying I'm optimistic, but I look around and I think, oh boy, everything is too damn expensive. <laughs> ah, slide number thirteen. Okay, so review dividends per share. How much dividends each share of stock will receive? Very simple calculation, and we don't have to do it. We just look it up. You take the annual dividends and divide it by the number of shares outstanding. And as we discussed, dividends became taboo in the 1990s. But since that bear market of 2000 to 2002, many investors have changed their minds again because uh, dividends don't lie and dividends can now be discussed in polite company. <laughs> oh, you like dividends? Yes, I do. Okay, you, you, we don't have to shun you. We are those who only are interested in capital gains. Well, you know what? How did that work out for you? 
Sometimes good, sometimes not so good. Slide number 14, the dividend yield. The measure of how much dividends are as a percentage of the stock price. You take the dividends per share and divide it by the market price per share. And again, just look it up. The, this important statistic allows an investor to compare a company to other forms of investments that pay income, such as savings accounts or bonds. And as we said, traditionally, 4 to 6% was good, but now, hey, 2% is what you often get from companies. Some are paying less. Well, treasury bonds are yielding under 3%. Now it's down to like 25 right? And many savings accounts are still yielding far less than 1%. But, but hopefully you notice that some savings accounts around the country have increased dramatically. You know, 1.5% is, is a big jump from 0.1%, but still, they're still low. And some stocks are paying much more than, than 2%. And, of course, um, the growth companies, some aren't paying any dividends or not even earning money. So slide number 15. So that's a, a review. Slide number 15, the dividend payout ratio. Again, we're going to zip through these last few slides quickly because these are all review. The measure of how much of a company's earnings are being paid out to shareholders in the form of dividends. Dividends per share minus divided by, sorry, divided by the earnings per share. So more mature companies often pay out almost all their earnings in the form of dividends, like utilities. They don't need the money to, they need some money to reinvest, but they're not growing. Whereas growing companies retain their earnings, you accountants know that's called retained earnings, to support the growth of the company. So, hey, we don't want to pay dividends. We need to grow the company. But eventually they grow to the size where the growth rate slows perceptibly, and they got all these cash sitting around, like Microsoft in 2003, like Apple now, what are they going to do with it? Well, it's time to start paying it to the shareholders, dear uh, dear CEO and, and uh, board of directors. And then the book value per share, remember this one? Net worth of the company, we like the word net worth, the accountants use the word equity. And um, tells an investor how much the assets are, are behind, how much ESA assets are behind each share of stock. In other words, as we discussed before, if all the assets of the company were liquidated, how much would each shareholder receive? It is common now for the actual market price of a share to be far above the book value per share since a company is worth more intact than if it were dissolved. I mean, think about a pizza shop. How much is the pizza shop work worth? If you were to sell all the assets, yeah, right, no. It's worth far more because it's in business. And so it is um, common for the market price to be far above the book price. Slide number 17, price to book value. Price to the share sales, right? These are, these are from chapter, we looked through these in chapter 6, remember? Um, given that the book value per share is often less than the market val price, the book value per share, Price to book value per share tells an investor how far above the book value the market price the market value is. For example, if they were one, they would be the same. But you're not going to see that, right? The price is twenty bucks, the book value is twenty bucks. You're just not going to see that unless the company is really in trouble, and then they're in danger if that if that uh, price goes below or below that book value of being rated for the assets. Today, three or four are not in common, and some are much, much higher. Slide number 18, price to cash flow. Remember, we take a look at the price and divide it by the cash flow instead of the earnings. Why? Because um, some companies have huge depreciation and other uh, uh, expenses or incomes that are not paid out in cash. So we take a look at the good quality versus the poor quality earnings. And what does that mean? Well, we, we remind, do you remember we talked about the um, uh, Lucent Technologies? They were making record earnings, and yet their checkbook was going down. How did that, how did that work? It doesn't make any sense. Well, they weren't really getting the money. They were selling the equipment, but all they were getting were IOUs from companies to pay them back over the next 10, 20 years, and most of those companies disappeared. And so all of a sudden, Lucent Technologies is now in deep trouble. They get their equipment back, but that stuff's obsolete. They don't, nobody wants it. 
So that's why we take a look at the cash flow. And then, <laughs> and during the internet mania, because many of these companies never earned any uh, income, they looked at the price to sales, right? Well, it's a, look how much they're selling. Well, how much are they earning? No, ah, don't look at the earnings. Don't look at the cash flow. Look at what they're selling. And, of course, a, you know, higher price to sales ratio suggested a higher sales growth rate, but not necessarily a higher earnings rate. And a lower price to sales ratio suggested a lower sales growth rate. So these were all um, the ones we've gone through, except for the peg ratio, which is really not that popular. These were all a, a review. In our next presentation, we will then now look at new ratios that uh, we will do some calculations and some of them we can look up. And so it's a good idea to print out, uh, at the very least, the, the balance sheet and the income statement. Okay, so make sure you have the balance sheet and the income statement. And then you might want to print out the formula sheet because we're going to do some calculations in our next presentation. See you in our next presentation where we uh, finish up the financial ratios.